please keep yourself on mute. Uh, we're going to we're expecting a large crowd tonight, and I know everybody wants to say hello to Gabriel, but uh, you you'll have a chance at the end, hopefully. Um, when we get to questions, if you could write your questions in the chat function, that will go to Daisy and she will ask the questions on your behalf. Or you can raise a virtual hand, um, which you can do by um, on the reactions button on your toolbar, or you can literally wave and we will look out for you and we'll try to get uh, to as many people as possible, we'll unmute you and you can ask your questions, okay? So if we stick to that, everything should go wonderfully. And now I'm gonna pass over to my colleague, Bea. Thank you, thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much. Yes, I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to take questions, um, but Daisy will also look at the chat. So we're going to try to combine those two things. Okay, more and more people are joining, but I think it's six o'clock, one past six. So I think we should start. I am delighted to welcome our audience tonight. So far we are on 110 and the number is going up um, to our event tonight, which features the writer and critic Gabriel Josipovici, who just celebrated his 80th birthday. So first of all, happy birthday, Gabriel. And thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you, Bea. <clears throat> delighted. Um, my name is Bea Lefkowitz. Uh, many of you know me. Uh, but I'm a social anthropologist and oral historian, and my general focus in the last 30 years has been on experiences of displacement and resettlement, memory and identity, and narratives and trauma. I'm the co-founder and director of two oral history archives, the AJR Refugee Voices and Sephardi Voices UK Archive. And these are the two organizations which are hosting this event tonight. Um, before we start to talk to uh, Gabriel, we would like to tell you a little bit about these two projects. We created the Refugee Voices Archive in 2003 for the Association of Jewish Refugees. The Association of Jewish Refugees is a welfare organization which was founded in 1941 and with help with, which helps its members, but today is also one of the biggest supporters of Holocaust education. Refugee Voices one, was one of the early educational projects funded by the okay, ATR. Cool. The mission of Refugee Voices was to capture the lives of the Jewish refugees and survivors from Nazi Europe who came to Britain. And I'm very proud to say that today we've collected more than 250 interviews or micro histories, as I prefer to call them, which consist of the actual interview, but also of thousands of digitized photographs uh, and documents. And due to the dedication of our digital content man manager, Susanna Kleeman, who is also with us here tonight, you can access a lot of our material on our website and our social media channels. And that's true for both projects, AGR Refugee Voices and Safari Voices UK. So please visit our website uh, and follow us on social media. We could have interviewed Gabriel for Refugee Voices because he spent the first five years of his life in wartime France, but because he grew up in Egypt, I interviewed him for almost six hours for the Sephardi Voices UK archive, which we founded in 2009. The mission of Sephardi Voices UK is very similar to Refugee Voices. It was to highlight an often overlooked chapter of Jewish migration and displacement, the often unknown and forgotten exodus of the 850,000 Jews from the Middle East, North Africa and Iran post-1948. A small number of these Jews found refuge in Britain and it was actually the largest post-war Jewish migration, and Sephardi Voices highlights, um, highlights their stories. I'm equally proud of the more than 100 interviews we've conducted for Sephardi Voices, which are accessible at the British Library. We've just launched our new website, and my colleague Daisy Aboudi uh, will tell you a little bit more about Sephardi Voices uh, at the end of the event. So without further ado, let us now turn to Gabriel Josipovici, who I was privileged to have met many years ago uh, through the Center of German Jewish Studies at Sussex University. Gabriel Josipovici was born in Nice in 1940. He spent his early childhood with his mother in wartime France before returning to his mother's native Egypt in 1945. He studied at Victoria College in Cairo until 1956, a few weeks before the Suez Crisis. Uh, Gabriel arrived in the UK when he finished his schooling at Cheltenham College and read English in St. Edmund's Hall in Oxford. 
1963, he joined the School of European Studies at Sussex University, where he taught for 35 years. He's the author of numerous novels and works of criticism. So, Gable uh, tonight has not only agreed to talk to us, but kindly offered us to read some of his excerpts from his most recent work produced in lockdown in spring 2020. So this is very exciting. It's a sort of premiere. And Gabriel, I'd like to ask you, please, to tell us a little bit. Let's start with the with this latest piece of writing. What is it, please? Okay. Um, <clears throat> when I decided, when I learned that we were actually going to lock down, um, and uh, my partner and I were going to be in Lewis uh, for certainly a month or two, uh, possibly more. I thought that I'd like to have a specific project that wasn't going to be too difficult. I didn't want to embark on a new novel because uh, the whole time was a tense time. And uh, anyway, I'm not the best of companions when I'm working on a, a novel. Uh, so I thought that what it came to me that what I might do was keep a diary for a hundred days. And I'm not a diary person, uh, this would be a short thing just to keep abreast of the changing seasons and what was going on in Britain and in the world. And after each diary entry to compose every day a different, what I called a thought or a memory. Uh, so something that would either be sort of autobiographical in a way or something to do that I needed to explore connected with uh, my writing or books that interested me, uh, composers who interested me, something short that I could do each one in a day. And it came to me that what I ought to do, uh, so as not to make it either simply boringly chronological or in any other way, was to use the alphabets to sort of trigger these memories and thoughts. So of course, this is a very weak constraint because uh, you know, it depended on me what I was going to put under each letter, and in some letters I might not put very much. But it did mean that there'd be, I thought, it might make for quite an interesting constellation of very diverse things. And indeed, it threw up some surprising uh, elements which I might not have thought of had it not been that uh, I suddenly thought, oh, well, I need another A or I need another Z or whatever it might be. So that was the... the, the, the the principle. As it happened, I wasn't able to completely fulfill that. A hundred days was the was good because by the end of that, the country was coming out of lockdown. We were from the 22nd of March when I started, uh, which actually was the spring equinox, and the 23rd was the, uh, the, the, the anniversary of my mother's death. So in a way, they were quite propitious dates. Um, and a hundred days from then, uh, we, were, we were coming towards the end of, uh, uh, I think that we were told that 4th of July, things are going to open up again. And that was sort of towards the very end of June. So um, that worked out all right. I was able to write only 87 uh, thoughts or memories. Some days I had to spill it over into two days. And once or twice I wasn't feeling all that well and I could just stagger along and do a bit of diary and so on. But by and large, that's how it worked out. Okay, I, I just think it's a brilliant idea and maybe people can use it for the next lockdown. Very inspirational. Um, I've seen, you know, the list, or you, know, you sent me the list and it's, I mean, very wide ranging. And of course today we don't have time for, for all of them, but, uh, I think some of the titles are very intriguing. Um, you write about, uh, you, you say it's a, a sort of alphabet of memory, which inspired by Tony Rudolph's book, Arith Arithmetic of Memory. And I just think that I love the idea of the sound of alphabet of memory. So why don't we start? You was, do you- I mean, can I just say something about that? I, Tony, uh, I, I'd read his book ages ago and I, I thought it was great. I I'd enjoyed it very much. And I remembered it as the alphabet of memory. Uh, I didn't take it down to check until I was three quarters of the way through my own book because I didn't want in any way to be influenced. And then I discovered, not to my horror, but to my amusement, that it wasn't called the 
the alphabet of memory at all, but as you say, the arithmetic of memory. So those are the tricks that memory plays on one, but it doesn't matter. But it might give you a possible title for it. What, what I thought there was since yeah. you're going to concentrate, I mean, there are roughly, I, I just counted them uh, this morning, and there are something like 27 little sort of biographical pieces, uh, something like 40 that are more thought pieces, but they might be on something like repetition or a particular book of mine that I wanted to revisit or think about why I had written it. Um, or uh, something of that sort, language, uh, and so on. Uh, so there are 27, 40 of those, and about 20 that move between the two, where you can't really yeah. distinguish them. And I thought that since you're going to concentrate on the, uh, obviously on the biographical ones, uh, given the context in which we are talking, I just read a tiny, one called Anonymous, sure. which would uh, at least put my view of what uh, the relation of biography to, to writing might be, at least in my own instance. Please. And it's just, it's just a page and a half. <clears throat> Much of the art I love best is Anonymous. The biblical narratives, Homer, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, the border ballads, the bulk of medieval art, plain chant, and traditional folk songs. And what is Shakespeare if not anonymous, as Borges pointed out in Everything and Nothing? And the modern artists I love too have on the whole been as anonymous as they could be. Eliot, when asked what he thought of Hugh Kenner's book about him, The Invisible Poet, with Eliotic deflection replied, I like the title. At the root of this is not so much the desire to hide, as the feeling that you only exist as you work. There's a passage in one of the poems of Samuel Hanagi, the Jewish poet who lived in Spain at the turn of the 11th century, which runs, she said, rejoice, for God has brought you to your 50th year in the world. But she had no inkling that for my part, there is no difference at all between my own days, which have gone by, and the distant days of Ner, but which I have heard. I have nothing in the world but the hour in which I am. It pauses for a moment and then like a cloud moves on. This must have meant a great deal to me in my forties for I used it as an epigraph in my 1984 novel Conversations in Another Room and again in an autobiographical piece I wrote at around that time for an American publication, Contemporary Authors. Since then, I've of course written a life, which though it's about my mother is inevitably also about me. I've explored the genesis of various works of mine in a long online interview with Victoria Best. And I've plundered episodes in my life to illustrate the intertwining of memory and forgetting, the desire to remember and the need to forget in my recent book, Forgetting. Ellie, my mother-in-law who sadly passed away at the end of uh, the summer, uh, Ellie said to me after reading that book, forgetting, you don't seem to be afraid of revealing a great deal about yourself, Gabriel. But I don't think I feel it that way. I can reveal precisely because it doesn't seem to be part of me. It seems to belong to someone else, a writer I've lived with, an immigrant I've known. That the writer and the immigrant are me is difficult for me to comprehend. This disconnect is, I think, experienced by everyone, even those who cling most forcefully to the notion that they have a biography as they move from one stage of life to the next. Beautifully expressed by a tiny poem of George Oppen's, which I remember Tony Rudolph sending me as one of his men cards. The title is Old Age, and the poem consists of just one line. What a strange thing to happen to a little boy. So while I admire Beckett's resolute shunning of interviews and refusal to talk, except to his intimates, about himself, I find this almost verges on the paranoid. To my mind, one can talk about the work and strangely even the life while preserving anonymity, not me, Gov. Borges again. The other one, the one called Borges, is the one things happen to. 
I know of Borges from the mail and see his name on the list of professors or in a biographical dictionary. It would be an exaggeration to say that ours is a hostile relationship. I live, let myself go on living, so that Borges may contrive his literature. And this literature justifies me. It's no effort for me to confess that he's achieved some valid pages, but those pages cannot save me, perhaps because what is good belongs to no one, not even to him, but rather to the language and to tradition. Besides, I'm destined to perish definitively, and only some instant of myself can survive in him. Little by little, I'm giving over everything to him, though I'm quite aware of his perverse custom of falsifying and magnifying things. Years ago, I tried to free myself of him and went from the mythologizing of the suburbs to games with time at infinity. But those games belong to Borges now, and I shall have to imagine other things. Thus my life is a flight and I lose everything, and everything belongs to oblivion or to him. I do not know which of us has written this page. Thank you, Gabriel. Well, hopefully we will see this in writing at some point as well, because I think it's quite a lot, a lot to take in. Um, when, what came across when, when you sent me the piece and when I read it is, is your ambivalence about writing uh, about yourself or what you call a, a disconnect between writing and biography, which of course I as an oral historian find very interesting because any oral history also creates a narrative or a story about a person. Um, you know, and it raises partly similar issues. So what I wanted to ask you is when did you start writing about yourself? And do you feel at a certain age one is more drawn to biographical writing? Well, I, as I say, I hardly have written about myself. I wrote this book about my mother after her death because as often one felt that, uh, I felt that this was a way of of making sense of my grief and of her and, and so on. And somehow that seemed to open up things so that I have found that I, as I say, I was able Which is to- this book, yeah. Yeah, that book, yeah. To, 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 to dig into things so that when, when I wrote this book on forgetting, which in some ways was rather abstract, was dealing with the interconnections of memory and forgetting in social and psychological and historical contexts, I felt I needed to anchor it. So every uh, few chapters, uh, there are two kind of interludes which deal with my own struggles with this, this strange hybrid of both memory and, and forgetting. One, an episode of, of uh, burning uh, a scrapbook which my mother and I had brought over from Egypt, um, but which somehow I wanted to, to put behind me. I felt I could only move forward in my life and in my writing if I, I felt it was nostalgic. Of course, it was weakness. I could see uh, later that it was precisely because I didn't quite know how to go forward that I felt I somehow must burn the bridges. Um, Sorry, so Gabriel, when did you write this and when, when did you burn it? When was this? When I burnt it, when I was a student at Oxford, I came back uh, on holiday. My mother and I had brought it out of Egypt just in the two suitcases we had. So it took up a little amount. It was a scrapbook of uh, various uh, sort of sporting events that I'd been sort of quite good at, either newspaper clippings or photographs or whatever. And when my mother came home from work, I confronted her with this and she responded in a way I hadn't expected. She said, but it wasn't yours to burn. And of course I felt terrible about that. Uh, but then now writing about this and thinking about it, perhaps it was precisely for that reason that I, who knows? I mean, I wanted to talk about all the complexities of one's relation to one's past. And you may be right that it may be as one gets older, one spends a bit more time uh, thinking about that. Do you, do you regret? Do you regret it that you burned the scrapbook? Yes, of course, of course. I'd love to see it. I'd love to show my <laughs> grandchildren and so on. 
uh, but you know, there it is. I, I thought, you know, that in a way that this diary that you wrote it after you wrote Forgetting, in a way that it's almost the sort of same part of the same process, um, you know, forgetting and remembering. Um, and I, I always remember this line from one of our interviewees, uh, which was a, a line in her autograph book, which is something I, it really st stuck with me. It's a memory is a paradise from which we cannot be banished. Mm -hmm. which, well, you know, now you mention it, I can see that there is a link between the two. I didn't when I settled down to, to write this, I thought of it as, I thought of it as a kind of reckoning, uh, not a memory as I, I thought even, and I might still call it a reckoning, coming up to my 80th year, I thought this is a good chance. Uh, the, 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 this awful COVID-19 uh, and the lockdown gave, me certainly a chance to sort of put a bracket around things and to feel okay even though I don't have to rush out to work every day and so on nevertheless you know there are certain things when life is going on but when everything stopped um, this seemed to be a really good chance to to explore of course one can't explore directly that's why I thought I could explore mm. in this indirect way nudged as it were by the alphabet. Okay, Gabriel, so please give us an example of a biographical writing, and we, we chose something with G. Well, <laughs> uh, you chose when... Oh, I chose, okay. When I sent you that. Um, indeed, I had a, you know, maybe because I didn't have many Gs and I didn't have many Js, I do have a very short piece about my name, uh, my first and my second name. Um, so this is a more biographical piece on Gabriel. I don't really know how other people feel about their names. Do you think finished? Hmm? No, no, finished? it's just... Sorry? Okay, go on, Gabriel. Uh, I don't really know how other people feel about their names, though I did know two young women who felt so dissatisfied with the ones their parents had given them that they chose a new one in their late teens. My partner is one of them. Personally, I'm perfectly happy with my name. It's common enough in England for people not to look baffled when I give it, though the barely literate will add an L and an E at the end, giving me what I consider actually a very ugly girl's name, while unusual enough not to feel that everyone has it. It's also a Jewish and biblical name without being aggressively so like Isaiah or Joshua. In Hebrew, the name means strong man of God or champion of God, Gibor El, which is also pleasing. In Egypt, the little boys would run after me, holding out their hands and shouting, Gibrial, Gibrial, meaning give me a real, a piece of money. I'd shoo them away while admiring their punning. People who've tried Gabby on me have been quickly squashed. For much as I like the full name, the shortened form has always struck me as unpleasant and even demeaning. My mother told me she chose my name, not because it was Jewish or biblical, but because she'd been reading a book by Chesterton called The Poet of the Lunatics, in which an eccentric poet called Gabriel Gale employs his extraordinary gifts of empathy to solve or prevent crimes perpetrated by madmen. It's often difficult in these stories, very Chestertonian in their deployment of paradox and with their concern with the imagination, sin and salvation, and clearly predecessors to the Father Brown stories to tell which is the poet and which the lunatic. Why my mother was reading the book at that time, I never found out. She talked to me about reading Queneau in those years in France before and during the war and Char and Éloire as the war was raging. They were very important to us at the time, she said, talking about the two poets, though when the war was over, they seemed rather thin to me but she never talked about reading any English literature. I wonder where Chesterton came from. She and my father had another child, a girl two years younger than me, but she died after 10 days as a result, my mother said, of malnutrition, my mother's. I felt guilty, she said on one of the rare occasions when she talked about the whole sad episode. I felt guilty because I starved myself to give you a little more than the rations allowed. And then this happened. I mention it here 
because after my mother's death, when I was trying to write about her, I realized I didn't know the name of my little sister. I wrote to my aunt asking if she knew and she wrote back saying she thought it was Elizabeth. I find that hard to believe. Even in 1943, my mother would not have chosen such a Christian name for her child when something as neutral as Eva or Nelly, her mother's name, would have done. I thought at the time I could probably find out by writing to the authorities in La Bourboule, who would have had a birth certificate, but something held me back, as it still does. When my mother died and I organized a memorial event for her in the meeting house of the university, hosted by my dear friend Andrew Robinson, the priest in charge of the university chapel, who had been visiting her at the time of her death in the Brighton Hospital, and by Jeff Newman, the friend and rabbi who had officiated at her funeral, and when the large gathering grew silent as the official starting time for the event approached, Jeff leant over to me and said, I'm going to introduce it, but I need to know Sasha's Jewish name. Jewish name, I said. I don't know if she ever had one. That was her name, Sasha Eleanor. I learned afterwards that it's the custom among English and American Jews, who seem often to have terribly English names like Arnold and John, also to have a secret Hebrew name. I'd never heard of such a thing in Egypt, though it may be in the case there too, since my own father after all was called Jean, and I have a distant cousin called Jimmy and a good friend called Donald, all born in Egypt of impeccably Jewish, though more or less totally assimilated parents. And it makes me wonder, do I have a secret Jewish name? Or is my name quite Jewish enough not to need it? Not, I have to say, a question that has ever kept me awake at night. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, I think this entry raises the, the theme of your wartime experiences in France, and obviously the, name, the, the, the theme of names and choices of names and Jewish names, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Please tell us a little bit about your early childhood in France and your stay in Nice and La Bourboule, and also how, how your mother kept you, kept you both safe. Well, uh, you know, all this, of course, I was very, <coughs> very young. I was born in 1940. Uh, my parents separated soon after my birth. My father went to Paris, uh, so I was with my mother. Uh, they'd been in a, they'd bought a, after being students at uh, the University of Aix-Marseille, two young uh, Francophone Egyptians. Uh, my father had decided that he wants to study there. And after their studies, they'd bought a house in Vence. But, um, after they separated, and for reasons I'm not quite clear, um, my mother had moved out of that house to uh, a boarding house in uh, Nice. And uh, this was where, um, in uh, September of 43, when Italy fell, um, and the Germans, you see, Italy was sort of the guarantor of the Jews of the Southeast and uh, were very much, of course, were quite sympathetic to their Jews. So um, while the fall of Italy, of course, was a, a great uh, advance for the Allies in their war on fascist uh, Germany and Italy, um, it was a terrible, caused a terrible danger for the Jews who'd taken shelter in the Italian part of France. The Germans closed this off, um, the, the, the Nice area, and then um, came in and proceeded to, to round people up. And uh, again, this is what uh, my mother explained to me. She thought the best thing she could do was to take me out uh, walking on the uh, promenade uh, in my pram, uh, rather than to be indoors in the pension. And she was walking along there when somebody grabbed her arm and it was uh, somebody who'd been a friend, uh, who'd been a neighbor in Vence, Ida Bourdet, the wife of a uh, resistance uh, fighter, Claude Bourdet, uh, who founded Combat, the journal later associated with Camus. Uh, there were photographs of him during the uh, the Algerian um, uprising, 
uh, their offices in Paris were bombed and so on. And Ida said to my mother, you know, what, what are you doing here? And she said, well, you know, I have nowhere to go. Said, where's, where's your husband? He's gone to Paris. Are you alone with the boy? Yes. So she said, look, you can't stay here. This is very dangerous. Come back with us tonight. I'll get you some forged papers. And I have some friends going to the Massif Central tomorrow on the train. You go with them. And uh, you get off at La Bourboule. They're going on to the Mont d'Or. And that's what we did. And we spent the last two years of the war in uh, the relative safety because uh, the Massif Central was an agricultural area. It was far from the war zones. The Germans didn't really come there except on occasional raids looking for uh, 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 partisans. Um, and uh, there was also a bit more food because it was agricultural. Uh, and so, you know, things weren't quite so, so dire. And so that was roughly it. And we saw out the war at the end of the war in 45, my aunt somehow got in touch with my mother and sent her the wherewithal to get tickets to get on a boat to Egypt. And Gabriel, do you have any an, any memories of your of your time in France? Do you can, can you remember that time? It's so difficult, you know, with memories before the age of five, how far they're real memories, how far they are things you've been told. I think I have memories of Italian soldiers in um, when we were still uh, in the south, uh, lying on the slope and giving us children uh, food from their uh, their own rations because of course they had children at home, ah bambino bambino. Um, and then of course I think I have quite strong memories of uh, a moment in how in the train journey where uh, I woke up, it was dark, we were in a station, I said, where are we? And somebody said Lyon and I thought of lions and was frightened. Um, obviously the fear in the carriage had sort of seeped through to me. Um, but you know, those are, and then I have some memories of La Bourboule, of walks and so on. And I, I did revisit both with my mother and then with my partner later. Um, on trying to, to recall and having difficulty actually uh, linking that with, with any, any feeling really. In the, in the book about, about your mother, you just described that you were, you were separated from your mother in the train journey. Mm, mm, mm. Something you remember? Or that... Well, that's something she told me and that made a great uh, impression on me because she said that... Um, Although we had, she had forged papers, she was not sure that if it came to it and the train was stopped and she was questioned whether she would not feel somehow that she had to say that she was Jewish, whatever the consequences. Uh, so she went to another carriage and I was with these people who were going in the same direction. And I thought, uh, she said, when she told me that, she told it to me with a kind of uh, puzzlement, as if she hadn't quite understood herself why she did that. After all, she was, you know, would have left her only child to the mercies of strangers. Um, but, you know, she clearly felt that this was a kind of moment of decision. And I think everyone, or a lot of, you know, some people, perhaps fortunate people, I don't know, have in their lives a, a moment when you do something you didn't know a moment before whether it would be what you would do and that sort of defines you and I think her kind of a sort of integrity uh, was what but she didn't say it boastfully or shamefacedly as I say she she when she told it to me I re recall distinctly it was with a kind of puzzlement that she should have done something like that. But, but as you wrote, she also gave birth in these difficult circumstances. Well, she was pregnant. And uh, so she, when we got to, to La Bourboule, a uh, short while later, she, she indeed did uh, uh, give birth, yeah. And 
I don't know, is it something your mother talked about a great deal? Or no, 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 she really, and you know, of course, when she died, I felt I'd like to have known more, but I just felt this was something she didn't, it was too painful for her. She wrote a poem, which I quote in the book about her, uh, the bitter poem about it. Um, and she talked to a friend, strange enough, a close friend of mine, a, uh, a writer friend uh, who we were on holiday with um, in the Dolomites. And uh, this friend later told me that uh, my mother talked to her a bit about that and said that if it hadn't been for me, she probably would have killed herself because, you know, it was such a bad time. And Gabe, do you find that this, this sort of silence, you know, we find this quite common in second generation of children of refugees who find that their parents sort of didn't talk about their traumatic experiences. Do you find that influenced you or, or your well, right? My mother talked about everything else. You know, mm. she talked about La Bourboul and we went back there together to have a look and she talked a great deal and she talked about, you know, her past and she talked about the war. So I never had that feeling. And in fact, her memory of the Germans, that you know, the Germans had come in and rounded up when when Ida Bourdieu you know, went back to the to, to, to the lodging house uh, where we were staying to uh, pick up the clothes. It turned out that the you know the, the trucks had had come along that street, but they'd stopped a bit short because they were full. Uh, but my mother's memory of that was they were such boys, you know, they were just boys. They were doing what they were told. And uh, I've often found that people who actually went through the war uh, seem to have a more uh, complex relation to it than people who you know, didn't and who can only try to imagine it and perhaps overdo certain things. Certainly it was very nuanced, but she didn't want to talk about it publicly. A colleague of mine, at Sussex, who's a specialist in the French resistance, um, very much wanted to do an interview with her about her wartime experience, and she refused. Mm -hmm. But I never felt that there was, you know, that she was hiding anything. That any, when I read about that in, in other uh, children of uh, people who've been through the war, um, I've accepted it and I could understand it, but it wasn't my experience, mm -hmm. apart from that one episode. Okay, I think maybe we can actually see some photos at this point, just to show what you looked like in France. <laughs> I think there are, we have some photos. Daisy, if you could just share the screen with us for a second. Ah. Gabriel, can you see it? Yes, I can see it. I can see. So, where is where are you in France? On the on the left. So oh. the first one is me and my mother, probably in La Bourboule. Uh, that's the one at the top, which I used as the cover of the book about my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, the one at the bottom left is of her mother and her older sister and herself. Older sister was always smiling and happy. Uh, she was the, the, the angry one. Um, their mother died, in fact, when they were five, and their father, uh, their father when they were five, and their mother when they were 10. So um, they had plenty to be scowling about. Uh, mm -hmm. The one uh, next to it is, in fact, in Mahaji, the town just outside Cairo, where I grew up by the canal. Uh, above that, uh, and to the right, yes, that one, is me with my two dogs in this same town, in the last house we had a lovely bungalow, which uh, <clears throat> I have a, a section on breakfast in, uh, in the book, which is about, uh, well, one of the, the paragraphs is about those breakfasts on that terrace there, uh, which were wonderful. The one on the right is, is my mother in Vence uh, with me. Uh, and the one at the bottom right is of an outing in the desert 
with friends. Uh, I can't see anything beyond that. Yeah, uh, that's that's all for now. We the just... one in the middle is me and my mother in uh, this house in Lewis with our collie dog um, that I found wandering about in, in London and who became a, you know, much the most beautiful dog we ever had. Okay, thank you. So just a sort of preview, which we're, which we're going to talk about now uh, in, in a second. Thank you, Bear. Um, yes, so the next, the next thing we, I wanted to ask you is about uh, your memories of going to Egypt and your life in Mardi near Cairo until 56. You first went to French school, then to the English school, and then to Victoria College. Um, so the question is, I wanted to ask you, did you feel you belonged to Egypt and which languages did you speak? Well, no, of course I didn't feel I belonged to Egypt because uh, unlike even people who left younger, I wasn't born there. You know, I arrived there and that again was a kind of bracket. I, I felt in my later life when I settled in England and I went to Oxford and then got the job at Sussex, that it seemed like a bracket around my life between the ages of five and 15. But of course they were important years. And, uh, and as I've lived on, um, I've had stronger and stronger memories of that. And uh, my partner often laughs at me because I seem to be uh, coming up with Arabic phrases more and more often. Uh, the language thing is, is very complicated and um, I have a section, uh, I wanted to explore it, I have a section on the English language because of course when I began to write, I don't know, do you want me to, to go yes, on? Yes, yeah. When I began to write, um, I envied painters and composers who deal in an international language because I felt I wasn't inward with English. English wasn't my first language. Um, I learned it when I was in Egypt, so again, it was, you know, it wasn't a, a one that was spoken all around me. Um, and the, 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 the people, I suppose, why I was drawn uh, to people like uh, Kafka or Beckett or Nabokov um, as writers was because, in a way, they struggled with this thing. Uh, what is their native language? Do they give it up? Uh, either they hate it like Beckett and want to stamp it out and sort of throw it away. Of course, he never quite could, but that was the ongoing thing. Or like Nabokov re reinvented himself in another language. Uh, but they had a native language to return to. And I felt, you know, I was born in France, but French wasn't really you know, I was there for five years. I never really mingled with, very much with other children, didn't go to school there. Um, I went to Egypt, but then, you know, Arabic wasn't my language. I learned it at school, learned a bit of it because it was badly taught, um, but it wasn't my language. Um, came to England. I only write in English. I wanted to be a writer. I just couldn't do anything else. Um, though, as I said, I'd have loved, faced with that problem to, uh, be a composer or a, a painter. But there I was as a writer and I seemed to be an English writer. Uh, I came across a, a phrase uh, that Stravinsky, um, a, a remark of Stravinsky's in his conversation with Robert Kraft towards the end of his life, which, which became a sort of mantra for me because uh, he says there, had Beethoven had Mozart's lyric gift, he would never have developed his rhythmic capacities to the extent he did. In other words, you know, make the most of what you have and perhaps you will have more than you thought. Um, and that's a great kind of thing to, to, to encourage one, but it still left that sense that, uh, that it's a struggle, that it's, it's, it's uh, I, I don't feel inward with the language. The only other writer uh, I've come across, the only other person who, who deals in language I've come across, who seems to have had some of this exactly the same sense that there's no language that's his, is Derrida, uh, surprisingly, not a, a, a philosopher I, I 
you know, I think he has some brilliant things, but he's not, you know, a favorite or anything. But he has a fascinating book called The Monolingualism of the Other, in which he talks about himself as a Jew raised in Algeria, uh, speaking French, not feeling at home with French because that was the colonial language, not feeling at home in Arabic because that was the language of the people around him, of his language, not uh, knowing any Hebrew because they were not a cultured family. Um, and he says there very interestingly that, uh, and it's again a bit like the Stravinsky thing, he said, but after all, we none of us have a language, we deploy a language, we use a language. So, you know, maybe this whole notion of a, a, a native language is a kind of nostalgia, a sense that, uh, that it would be lovely to go back to something, which of course you can't go back to. So maybe this, this experience of mine simply highlights something that, that we all have really, however rooted we are. Well, certainly it reflects the, uh, the the Jews of the Ottoman Empire who had, you know, who were, were in very multilingual situations and settings in school at home. Um, yeah. And it's yeah. interesting whether you think of it as an advantage or disadvantage. Yeah. Um, but just coming back to Egypt. So tell us a little bit. We saw your house in Mahdi. Just can you tell us a little bit more about it and sort of set the scene? Well, there were many houses. I mean, we were moving all the time. We were okay. renting, renting, renting. And... My memory of that is uh, changing house, uh, piling all the one's belongings onto a donkey cart. Uh, that, that was the removal man. He came around and piled the things on, and you walked along behind, picking up anything that fell off with your animals. We always had dogs and the odd cat. Uh, and uh, moving to some other thing. This last, the house that you saw, was a house that we actually had, had bought, that my mother bought with the inheritance that was all that remained of what had once been a, a very wealthy family. Uh, her great, great grandfather had come from Ferrara and had married into a, a wealthy Egyptian Jewish family, uh, Katawis, which went all the way back as it were to the, <clears throat> to the Cairo Geniza. Um, but all that was left was a house in in a not very what had become a not very salubrious part of Cairo, uh, which my mother and my aunt inherited, and they sold it and split the proceeds, and each bought a house uh, with it. But uh, we couldn't move into that house because it belonged to uh, a Swiss firm, so they were sort of sitting tenants, and it was used. They said that they were building a house for. Uh, their director, uh, but the house kept not being built, not being built, not being built, but eventually it was, and we had two years there, and it was wonderful. It was, it had a canal on one side, and we were very near to the sporting club on the other, which was a kind of social and sporting center, all, all the youth and, and every, all the middle class families in, in Egypt. Mm. Well, there's obviously more to talk about, but I'm, I'm looking at the time. What tell us a little bit about your the circumstances surrounding you leaving Egypt with your mother? Please. Well, um, I I think the, the, the kind of assumption always was that uh, somehow I'd go to an English school. Uh, she'd taken me out. Of course, my mother had first sent me to a lycée because I only spoke French. And then she was horrified, this little boy of five who'd been through the war, they were making him do homework. There was no play. Where do I find a school where the child isn't going to have to work too hard and can play? An English school. And that's when my cousins had gone to a little primary school. I went there. And um, then I, Victoria College had moved to uh, new premises in Mahdi just when I was going to had, had at, at the age of 12, so I, I went there. Uh, so the idea had always been I would go to university in England and my mother would always say, yes, yes, you, you, you know, you'll go to Oxford. And she went to see the headmaster of this English school and said, I, how do I, you know, we can't afford it. How can I get a grant? Can you find out, can you tell me how I could get a grant to see him through Oxford? And the headmaster patiently said, well, you know, there are other universities. Um, in England, 
Um, uh, but as far as my mother was concerned, there was, you know, it was the old fashioned thing. There was Oxford for the arts and Cambridge for the sciences. And um, he said he'd look into it and he found that the only way was for me to actually do A-levels in England and get a state grant of some kind there and uh, sit for an entrance exam or, 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 or go for interviews to, to universities. So um, he found a, a place for me for one year of A-level in England. So we were all set to go and we were about to go in the summer of uh, 1956. And NASA uh, uh, nationalized the Suez Canal. There was huge tension. We were trying to get exit visas. We were going around all the time to the uh, equivalent of the Home Office, which was this enormous Kafkaesque building with these great long corridors full of sort of peanut sellers and so on, and where one saw everybody desperately trying to get exit visas. And you would, you know, spend a morning waiting in a little room for the officer uh, at the desk to call you forward. He'd call you forward, he'd look at what you had and he'd say, I can't do anything until you've been to room 364 and had this done. So the same thing would happen the next day, you'd go to room 364. And eventually when the officer saw the papers, he'd say, I yes, I can't stamp this until you go to room 694 um, to do that. And so we spent the summer, I'd been going to go and see my father who had remarried and was living in, in uh, Cannes. Um, um, I hadn't seen him uh, since he'd, he'd left us in, uh, during the war, but um, you know, he very much said he wanted to see me and I thought, okay, but you know, we were held back, we were held back, we were held back. My mother was pulling all the strings she could. By that time, she'd managed to acquire an Italian passport because her mother had been Italian. I had acquired a French passport because my father had meanwhile become French and he was born in France anyway. His father was born in France. So, um, you know, we were just, it looked as if there was no way we were going to get and things were getting more and more tense. It was incredibly hot. So of course, there's a lot of anxiety and we of course had to pretend that we were simply going there so that I would go to school in, in England. Uh, we couldn't say we were going for good because uh, then you know all sorts of questions would be asked and my mother had managed to sell that house and to spirit out the, the, the proceeds, um, losing you know, two thirds of it, but still to a Swiss bank. So it was a question of somehow getting there. Um, but suddenly, you know, the way bureaucracy works, suddenly something unblocked at one end and then everything unblocked and suddenly we were ready to go. And did, did you realize that you were going for good? Did you realize? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I mean, you know, I realized, I've been realizing for some time and it was terribly painful. We had, we put down some of our dogs, but there were two, who we dearly loved and my aunt was uh, a passionate animal lover and she said, I'll take them. So there were friends that I was parting from, there were you know, girlfriends I was parting from, there, was, there were these animals. So it was difficult, but that, there it was, you know, we were going off, but until the last minute, until we were on the boat, we were not sure whether we wouldn't be stopped and, uh, uh, called back and asked to account for, for this money and so on. No, I think the, uh, in, I remember from your interview, the, the, you know, the topic of the dogs, it's not something people think about, you know, in many interviews, people talk, we had to leave the door pretending to go on holiday, but you know, what do you do in this situation when you have uh, animals? It's, it's, exactly. it's, it's a, you know, yeah. a sort of symbol of, of immigration that you just can't, can't take them. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> you, have, you have written one of the stories. We, I don't think we have time now to, to go into it, but hopefully when people can read it called Agami, maybe just tell us a little bit about it. Well, Agami is this little, uh, beautiful little tiny resort, which uh, I hardly spent any time in. But again, um, the exigencies of uh, the alphabet forced it out of me. And I suddenly thought, oh, yes, 
where I'd spent an idyllic time at the age of 12. It was just some uh, little villas, uh, a lot of white sand and fig trees growing out of the sand and sea. But the, there was no running water, so only people with cars could go there. And a friend of mine, we didn't have a car, but a friend of mine asked me if I'd like to go and spend time with the family. So I did and had a blissful week, extraordinary, you know, in, in my memory, it's kind of paradise. Um, and as we were leaving, we we leaving Egypt in, in uh, September of 56 or late August of 56, uh, we... Um, uh, were taken. We, we stayed in Alexandria for two or three days with some friends of my mother's and they took us out there uh, for a swim and just, I don't know if one of them had a chalet there or something. Uh, so of course it was lovely, but it was tinged with that, you know, deep anxiety of what was the future going to hold and what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um reading this when I read the, the that little story you know it, it I was thinking of all the the huge amount of exile or memoir literature written by Egyptian Jews you know such as Andre Asiman uh, or you know Lucette Lanyado the man in the white shark suit so obviously there's more and more literature coming up and I, I wondered what you how you relate to this whole body of work what what do you think about it well I <laughs> Again, why I related to my mother-in-law, Ellie, was because she was always extreme. She had had to leave Vienna, you interviewed her, uh, and uh, at the age of 10. But she always thought this was the greatest thing, or she said, and I have no reason to disbelieve her, that this was the greatest thing that happened to her. It, it, it pro propelled her into... So there's no nostalgia there. And I felt that there were a lot of people who had to leave Egypt who looked back at it terribly nostalgically. Of course, because I hadn't, you know, been born there, it, none of that nostalgia rubbed, rubbed off onto me. Uh, my mother had never been particularly happy. You know, she said, you know, she married my father and he wants to go to France and she was only too happy. She had very sad memories of her own childhood because of being an orphan and so on and she wasn't unhappy with her grandparents uh, but she felt ah you know coming to France with my father she thought that was where she was going but actually where she really wanted to go was England where she'd had an English nanny and the English nanny once when they were in uh, in uh, Bergplage in Normandy uh, just before the war they'd come to see their father who was in an asylum there um, and she said, there, that's my country over there across the channel. So she was keen to come. So we both of us felt this was uh, a release rather than, you know, Egypt had never felt like home to me, really. Although, as I say, I found recently that I have lots of strong memories, but they're memories of, uh, Mm, of smells or of um, place, not not of you know not of the life. The way of life was not one I I liked, and I'm not good with heat anyway. I began to feel alive when I came to England, and it's rather more bracing climate, let's say. I think you're one of the few Safadi voices interviewees who feel that way. <laughs> um, well, as some of you might have figured out, so we both share the same mother-in-law, Ellie. Uh, Ellie Miller, who sadly passed away, but yes, yeah, she did say that in her interview with me many twenty years ago. You know that she felt enriched by the experience of emigration, um, and I think she shares that with many other people of her generation. You know who came as young teenager and who could finish their education in England. I think that's an important point. You know that you mm -hmm. still go to school here. Um, what I, I think. Um, you know, you raised this topic of home and identity. I think it's an important topic uh, in all our interviews. And it's certainly a, a very important topic for me, uh, you know, being a, a daughter of Holocaust survivor, having grown up in Germany. Um, in the interview, of course, we, we talked about uh, identity and you, you come up with this concept of, of waves of identity. Um, and in the interview with Victoria Best, you, you say, uh, you feel you don't have a maternal country to dream about. And as you said before, no maternal language. 
So I wanted to ask you, you know, how you would describe yourself in terms of your identity. Well, I used to describe myself as a Jew uh, brought up, born in Europe, brought up a, a European Jew who, who spent some his childhood in Egypt and now lives in England. Uh, sadly, with Brexit, uh, I feel, I think, a bit like uh, Austrians must have felt after the end of the First World War, when Austrian Jews, as part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they suddenly found they were just Austrian, part of this tiny little, possibly rather nationalist and chauvinistic rump. And the, the, the large multilingual empire they, they had belonged to had been pulled from under their feet. So I certainly felt European, I joined the School of European Studies at Sussex and was extremely happy there and felt that at last, if I had any home, I'd come to some kind of home. But, uh, you know, maybe homes don't last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in Jewish Book Week this year, you said you, you don't see yourself as a Jewish writer. Um, please tell us a little bit more about, you know, why this is the case, but also I know you study the Bible and ancient Hebrew is very important to you. Uh, and you hinted at that in the story of Anonymous. So the, my question is, what does being Jewish mean to you? Yeah, well, I, I don't study the Bible, I read it. And you read it. <laughs> enjoy it. Um, you know, like, like a lot of assimilated Jews, um, you know, when I had a a kind of religious crisis as an adolescent. It was a, a Christian religious crisis. I was reading Dostoevsky and Milton. And when that passed, I didn't think anything more about it. But in my thirties, as I suppose often happens, uh, as I was struggling with my writing, I think, um, struggling with a feeling that um, unlike most people in, most writers I knew in or, or read in Britain, like a few writers, but unlike most of them, uh, I had the feeling that there was no place from which I could stand back and write, you know, in the third person, have a narrator uh, narrating something. I had to explore it to, to be, the only way of writing was to sort of be on the way and uh, try and discover as I went on what it was about. And it was very strange starting to read the Hebrew Bible, uh, to read Buber and Rosenzweig, to see that in fact in Judaism and in the Bible, this sense of, um, of wandering, and if, like, if you like, of wandering in the wilderness, uh, was uh, not something that had to be overcome, but was part, was a central aspect of it. I'd read in Kafka's diaries, a remark which I had marked as, as an adolescent or maybe a young 20-year-old uh, um, at Oxford, uh, a remark where he says, you know, Moses didn't arrive in the promised land, not because of anything he did, but because he was a man. Uh, so that it's part of our, that is one aspect of uh, the biblical uh, story, as it were. It's not one of arriving, but of, of going. And um, I found this both as a writer and uh, as a person, a, a, a very uh, helpful and uh, uh, a comforting thing to feel that there was a tradition that, that sort of held, held that to be an important element in life rather than something that must be overcome. And that there were great dangers in thinking about promised lands as, as something that could be fulfilled. So the, the journey, the importance of... Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have prepared many, many more questions, but I, you know, we want to give people time to ask questions. So my last, the last question I'd like to ask you is to come back to the beginning of our conversation about the representation of, you know, uh, biography uh, in writing. I have recently sent you the transcript of our interview 
Uh, I'm not sure you've looked at it in detail, but I wanted to ask you, first of all, because there's so many interviewees here also tonight, I can see them on the screens. I wanted to ask you what it felt for you, what it felt like to be interviewed uh, for a project like Safadi Voices, and also uh, what it felt like to see it written down in forms of a transcript or in form of a film. And, you know, did you feel that your story was sort of reappropriated or re-represented? You know, so I'm particularly interested in, in, in that as, as, a, as a part people of the story. Are, people asked, uh, often said to my mother, oh, you should write down your, your story. It was a very interesting story, but she felt she wanted to move forward. She didn't want to look back. She said to me, you know, I don't want to look back. Um, and I think I feel a bit the same way. Um, I, I don't want to simply repeat a thing that's there. Uh, you know, every day has to be a new day, it has to be, uh, you know, uh, a new adventure, one has to be exploring. And although, you know, I enjoyed writing these, these biographical pieces, they helped me to think about things that being important. It doesn't really seem that important. And I have to say, when you sent me the transcript, I looked at it with horror. Uh, because, you know, there it was, one's life was there, or at least what one had said. But, you know, it's just my saying it. And perhaps, um, you know, one has to, you know, one can't ever really tell one's story. And perhaps, I, I feel perhaps one, one shouldn't. I mean, I think if one has things that have happened in one's life that are interesting, as we have been talking about perhaps in this, interview and it can be interesting to other people that's fine but it's not something I you know would feel was very high up on on any sort of agenda or want to spend any time doing really mm -hmm. I mean I you know an interview is fine I enjoyed our previous conversation as, as I have this one mm -hmm. so what Gable so just to finish now what what do you want to spend your time doing what if there's another lockdown have you got any further plans no no I think it this took it rather out of me but it did loosen things up and I, I have started a novel which uh, I had I mean nothing may come of it. it it may just dribble away into the sand as these things often happen but I had got rather dry and was very anxious about not having been able to write since uh, the last novel, uh, which was, you know, four, three or four, five, finished it about four years ago, um, The Cemetery in Barnes. And I thought and said to people, oh, maybe that's the last thing I'll ever write. And I remember my good friend, Lawrence Lerner, the writer who lived around the corner, said, Gabriel, I've heard that so often from you. And you always write another one. I said, yes, but there'll come a time when it'll be true. Uh, when you know one will dry up or one won't be able to, so so this did seem to loosen something. So maybe something will will happen. Maybe if there's another lockdown, but but who knows? It's it's a question. Okay, okay. We look forward to hearing more. So in the meantime, I just want to say thank you so much, Gabriel, for talking to us. And we are now going to open the floor to questions. So if you'd like to say something, please wave your, either wave your hand or write a message in the chat box. So if you can wave your hand, uh, either digitally or literally, I can look out for you and we can unmute you. Any questions for Gabriel? I've got a written question here. Okay. Uh, how did the short story Steps from the early 1980s eventually grow into the novel The Cemetery in Barnes? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, it was... Um, <laughs> how did it? You, uh, I write very short novels and even sh and extremely short, short stories, sometimes not more than a page and a half, um, or a page even. Um, and usually I'm very happy with that. I feel that uh, another mantra of mine comes from a poem of John Berriman's where he says, write as short as you can in order of what matters. And I think all three of those elements are quite important. 
But with that particular story, somehow I felt maybe it was too compressed. Nobody seemed to get it. Uh, people who read it said, I enjoyed your story, but why did you do that? And I felt, no, they're not, they're not understanding, they're not getting it. And so over the years, I'd been sort of toying with the idea of, uh, of seeing if there was a rhythm, a slightly larger rhythm that could um, allow more things to, to emerge. And eventually, um, there was a space for it. Uh, I wasn't involved in anything else. And I thought, OK, I've thought about that enough. Let's give it a go. By the time I finished it, and it, be it had become a cemetery in Barnes, I thought, oh dear, maybe, you know, all I've done is ruin a very good short story uh, by elaborating it. I wasn't sure that I had enriched it. Um, I have no idea. Uh, people seem to have liked it. It's just come out in German and in, in uh, Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> amazingly enough. Um, so it pleases a few people, but um, that's, how it, that's how it happened. That's how it, it became. I wanted to find, see if there was a rhythm there which uh, could be developed and elaborated and allowed to, to, to uh, find perhaps it, its proper uh, form. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Daisy, can you see somebody? Otherwise, I'll ask. Uh, uh, Deborah Guth, can you unmute yourself? There we go. Yes. Yeah, Deborah. Right. Okay, Gabriel, this is going back a few years. Yes. To the world and the book. Yes, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> That was such a wonderful book. I mean, it was written for me from such a wonderful European point of view, rather than narrowly English. Um, and of course, everybody was reading it as well and saying, what an amazing book. What was the impetus behind that book? It was very unlike standard, you know, English literature, English lit criticism. Um. Well, there wasn't a an impulse behind it. Uh, uh, Yeats says somewhere that uh, you have all your ideas by the age of 21 and you spend the rest of your life sort of discovering what they are. And in fact, from uh, about the time that I was finishing my undergraduate time, I was scribbling down certain things. I was fascinated by the I started then to do a, a, a billet at Oxford on uh, Rabelais, on Swift, uh, and um, on these. So I was interested in, people often said, you know, Rabelais and Joyce are so similar, uh, but no one ever actually explored why they might be similar or if there was more to it than just simply linguistic exuberance. Um, I, I didn't get on with my, the piece I was trying to write. I hated writing it. I wasn't cut out for it. I came to Sussex and David Deitches, who was my first boss, took me aside and said, how's the thesis going? And I said, it's not going well. Um, I'm not cut out for that sort of thing. And he said, you think there's a book there somewhere? And I said, well, there might be. And he said, I wouldn't worry then about finishing it. You'll have plenty to do preparing for our courses. And of course, this would be unimaginable. Well, as you well know, unimaginable even a few years later, uh, not just in Israeli uh, academia, but everywhere that you had to have done a doctorate, possibly even now have a, another book as well before a university would, would give you any kind of full-time employment or any employment perhaps. But those were... Golden years. Wonderful years, but also it was everyone gained from it. You know, a bad book was not put out into the world, which would have, or at least a, a, an un, un, an immature book, which uh, wouldn't have uh, allowed a, a similar book to 
to emerge a bit later, mm -hmm. um, I'd have, you know, it, it wouldn't have been, a, there wouldn't have been any point. As it was, I was a bit older by the time I finished it. I had taught at Sussex, I had expanded my, I taught Dante there and I, you know, expanded uh, my range of sort of awareness and things began to sort of fall into place, but they fell into place in, you know, in disparate essays. So there wasn't an impulse for a book. I was struggling with something. And uh, a wonderful editor, who was also an, a writer himself and a biographer, Nick Furbank, P.N. Furbank, the biographer of Forster, was working for Macmillan's and he got in touch. He'd read an article of mine and he said, uh, he'd like to have lunch with me. Uh, he was a terribly, terribly shy, stammering Englishman. And it was a very, very difficult lunch, but he was very, very encouraging. And somehow he said, I think all these essays uh, need to sort of come together somehow. And I'm not quite sure how, but suddenly when I got the title, The World in the Book, uh, and again, Borges was to some extent there behind that, uh, it, it sort of fell into place and I, yeah. I saw the way forward. But I didn't want to write a critical book before I'd written a novel or published a novel because I felt I didn't want to be seen as a critic then writing novels, but as a novelist perhaps writing some criticism. So I had published my first novel in 68 and uh, I then sent it to uh, Nick Furbank and he honed it a little more and guided me and we eventually put that together as, as the book that you, you read and I'm very pleased liked. The Inventory, yes, Gabriel, The Inventory. The Inventory was the first one, yeah. The first and, one. and that has a, a, a curious thing to it, you know, because uh, I wrote it, I was, it was just the idea that was so interesting. I loved the, the word which went in two directions, you know, to invent and inventa inventarium, mm. uh, a list, something completely objective and something very subjective to invent. I know they're different Latin words I discovered, uh, but, you know, as far as English is concerned, these words, so, so my subject emerged from that. It was the idea that uh, uh, a man dies uh, and, uh, the solicitor goes to be with a family to draw up an inventory of this person's, uh, what, what he has left behind. And in the course of that, looking at these different things, people, the family starts to remember aspects of, of course, no two of them having the same memory of that person uh -huh. uh, through these objects. And it came to me as I was trying to write it, that I could do it through a combination of dialogue and lists so that I'd avoid this thing of telling a story. Um, and many, many, many years later at this German Jewish center, uh, there was an Austrian uh, academic who was teaching something on the modern novel. And she said, I'd like to do uh, a session on, on your book, um, uh, The Inventory, uh, would you come along? And, and I said, but why? my book, she, I think she's dealing with it from a, from a Jewish point of view. I said, there's nothing Jewish in that. But of course there is, because, um, you know, it's, it's all about, you know, the possessions and the lack of possessions and letting things go and what one discovers from having the, those things had never, never crossed my mind, but it may be that it, you know, she was right. Who knows? I mean, once the book is out there, <laughs> it's, um, you know, other people can see things in it which perhaps you hadn't and they may be right mm. i think there was a question yes. thank you very much uh, charles corman if you can I'm just... like, there's a written one as well so yeah charles yeah charles you're unmuted you have to unmute yourself thank you so much for your talk i found it very interesting especially when you were explaining the difficulties of writing in what to you was initially a foreign language. I've recently been reading the book called Genius and Anxiety by Norman Lebrecht, which I'm sure will be known to 
uh, Joubert and to a number of other people. And there is a very moving section there uh, dealing with Elsa. But we can't quite hear you. Can you move into there the- There is a very moving section there dealing with the problems of writing in a foreign language, uh, focusing on Elsa Lasker Schuler, who moved, as you know, from Germany very reluctantly to Palestine, obviously it's about to become Israel, in the 1930s, and how desperately lonely she was, not just for company, but for people who could relate to her and her writing in Germany. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on her situation. Before you answer that, Gabriel, the question that we've got written it links in quite similarly. So I'm going to say that as well, and you yes, can answer yes, them sorry. both. Um, given your fascinating comments on language, perhaps you could comment on the meaning for you personally of Wittgenstein's famous line, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. <laughs> uh, well, I find Wittgenstein, particularly later Wittgenstein, not that, not the Wittgenstein tractatus, uh, always very, very stimulating. I'm never sure that I fully understand. Uh, but they're always stimulating. Uh, but I wouldn't want to go to try and, and explain or explore that. But on the somehow looking at it sideways and linked to the Lasker Schuller uh, thing, of course, I mean, I, I uh, as I say, some, someone like, like Kafka, not Lasker Schuller so much, but Kafka was was very important to me in um, admiring the, the, the stories enormously, more than the novels, I think. Um, I, as I still do, I think that they're, 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 one can just read them again and again and again. But the diaries show, particularly the early diaries before he finds his voice, uh, show this struggle with somebody who, uh, who, who recognizes that in the world, in our modern world, and I think it's still Kafka's world and my world, you know, uh, not, you know, belong to a kind of modernity. Um, uh, there is something problematic about writing like uh, people wrote in the 19th century, but that doesn't mean that there is something else, another way of, of, of doing it. And, uh, Kafka struggled with this and struggled with his sense that, uh, you know, the words, as he says in a wonderful diary entry, the word Mutter uh, is a very German word. How does it, it doesn't really help a Jew to understand his relation to his mother. Um, so that um, all that was, was, you know, something I could sort of relate to and identify with and find uh, a source of comfort, the sense that somebody else had been there, that one's own struggles were not uh, unique. There might not be all that many people and the bulk of writing seemed unconcerned with any of these issues, but there were artists who were concerned and they were artists I happened to admire. So that was, you know, very rewarding. I'm sure if I'd, <clears throat> you know, uh, been able to read a Hebrew and German, um, some other poets and poets like Lasker Schull and so on would have been equally important. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Any other questions from anyone? Otherwise, Gabriel, I just, just before we, we come to a close, I wanted to ask you, you have got a wonderful entry on the letter uh, J where you write about your grandfather. Maybe you can just tell us very, very briefly what that is about. Well, I did write, as I said, there was one about Gabriel and one about Jespovici. Um, and I begin this entry, it's slightly longer, so <coughs> let me won't read it, uh, by saying how once when I was in Romania for the British Council in the late seventies, uh, I was in Cluj 
and um, I was asked if uh, I'd like to go on a trip to uh, see a model village, a uh, traditional village in, in uh, the countryside. And the car would come around to me at a certain time. I said, yes, that'd be lovely. And then they rang and they said, uh, there's a Polish professor who's also visiting the university and uh, may he join you? I said, I'd be delighted. So they picked me up and then we go around to the hotel and pick up this dapper uh, gentleman in a nice gray suit. And he gets into the car and as he gets into the car, he says, do I have the pleasure of uh, meeting a relative of Albert Josipovici? Now, no one in England had ever mentioned my grandfather who was in his time, quite a famous writer. He wrote a book called Gohar de Saint, that in fact, um, had a preface by Octave Mirbeau, came out in 1919 and was shortlisted for the Goncourt in the year that Proust won it. Very recently, there was a, um, uh, a book uh, commemorating the, well, in, in 2019, commemorating the, the Proust Goncourt. And uh, the chap was reviewing it for the TLS, uh, who was there, their French edit, editor of French books there, uh, Adrian Tahoudin, uh, emailed me and said, is this Joseph Bovici who's referred to in this book a relative of yours? I said, yes, sir, he's my grandfather. Um, and uh, so he actually did mention this in, in his review of, of the book. It's, it's not a bad book, I've, I've read it. Uh, uh, my grandfather, who of course I never knew, he died in 36, um, wrote it with his brother-in-law. Uh, Albert Adez, Albert Josipovic and Albert Adez, two young Francophone uh, Egyptians in France during the war. And they took the idea of uh, Goha, who's the Egyptian folktale hero. And this is the time of sort of Orientalism. So they wrote about a, a so-called medieval Cairo, which was a, an imaginary Cairo really um, of the, the Orientalist imagination. But it's, it's rather charming and it's still in print. Uh, Kalman Levy uh, have kept it in print. And, uh, and there it is. Mm. Nice. And I think we can read it. It came out in English, Go the Fool, in 1924. Yeah, yeah. So, and in fact, my friend Stephen Matka found a copy for me in a secondhand bookshop of uh, the English uh, <laughs> translation. Okay. Okay, Gabriel, I just, again, would like to thank you really for sharing your new materials and for answering my questions. Um, and I'd like to also thank my colleagues from the AGR and from Safari Voices UK for helping with the event um, and give the last word to, so I'm thinking on, on behalf of the AGR and maybe Daisy can say just very briefly something about Safari Voices. And thank you everyone for coming and staying with us for that long and um, see you again soon. Daisy. Thank you, Bea. Thank you, and thank you, Gabriel and Bea. It was a fascinating discussion, and thank you all for attending as well. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about Safadi Voices. Um, as Bea said, we are an oral history charity. Um, we focus on recording the life stories of Jews who lived and grew up in the Middle East, North Africa, and Iran, who now live in the UK. Uh, we've interviewed over 100 people to date, and we've just launched a brand new website uh, this week, um, www.safadivoices.org.uk, where you can find some of our archive material. We've got amazing photographs. We've made some really interesting films, one on identity, which we kind of touched on today. Um, we are a very, very small charity and we have a very small budget. Um, and we rely totally on donations to be able to continue interviewing, to continue transcribing, making our interviews accessible um, to researchers and to the general public through films and events, you know, like, like this one today. So if you are able to help us and contribute in any way at all, we would be extremely, extremely grateful to anyone who could help in any small way. Um, you will get an email tomorrow with um, the details for Safari Voices and for the um, AJR and with a link 
when it comes out, when we've uh, managed to process it to, to this interview, a recording of this interview as well. That probably won't be tomorrow, but it will be soon. Um, so again, just thank you all very, very much for attending and thank you again to Gabriel and to Bea. Thank you very much, Daisy. Thank you. And ju just maybe the, the last word is of the 100th interview. I think we must have about 30, 20 to 30 uh, interviews with Jews from Egypt. I think probably more, yeah. Even more. Even more, yeah. Um, so please come and, and uh, look at it. And I'm, I'm glad some of the, my interviews, Gabriel's cousin is here with us, Nicolette. Uh, and, uh, and Jimmy, who are both interviewed, uh, and some other people. So and if you know anyone who wants to be interviewed, send them our way. We are always, you know, every story, every story counts and every story matters. Yeah. So thank you for coming and have a good evening. Bye. Thank you, Beth. <clears throat> bye bye. Bye bye.